This morning our, our topic is on genetic engineering. Um, I'm going to try to answer several questions. Uh, and um, this is not going to be comprehensive. And um, we hope for uh, some input from the audience afterwards. Um, what is gen genetic engineering? How is it used today? Um, and um, are there good uses and bad uses? And I think the answer will be, a, a, at least in my opinion, obviously yes, although uh, you're welcome to uh, comment further. What can we do about it? And uh, perhaps more importantly, what should we do about it? And um, are there implications for the uh, creation evolution controversy? And I, I think there are, and I'll bring those out. The genetic engineering is uh, actually a twofold definition. I'm going to give you the first part because it sounds like a really good definition, but it isn't quite. The insertion of genetic material into a living organism with the intent that this genetic material will become part of the genome of the organism. That's genetic engineering. Now, I say that that way. Um, selective breeding really doesn't introduce new genetic material into an organism. And um, so selective breeding really doesn't count for genetic engineering, even though in a kind of very broad sense it is. Um, accidental introduction of genetic material doesn't really qualify for engineering may qualify for changing the genome, um, but the point of genetic engineering is to deliberately change the genome for some purpose. And uh, to be fair, deletion of genetic material also qualifies as genetic engineering. Uh, and there, we've genetically engineered bacteria, for example, who have all but one of the genes of the uh, Flagellum, and that's how we know that every single gene is necessary, is because none of those make flagella. And that's genetic engineering, to be technical about it. It's changing the genome deliberately uh, by invasive methods. Um, and what kinds of uses do we put genetic engineering to? Well, one we've already spoken about, and that is doing uh, experiments. Uh, but the major uses that we're going to be talking about are the production of biologically active proteins from organisms. That's number one. That's things like insulin, human growth hormone, uh, tissue plasminogen activator, any of you who've had um, um, uh, stents, and angioplasty and things like that are, uh, some of you will be alive today because of that particular chemical. Um, monoclonal antibodies, the list is getting larger and larger all the time. Um, and um, there are crops that have been engineered to have <coughs> resistance factors to, say, certain chemicals or nutritional factors engineered in so that uh, the crops don't have to be sprayed for those things, so that they already have them, or perhaps the crops can be sprayed with something. And um, finally, animals that have special properties. Most of these are not eaten. Those are things like um, jellyfish or mice that glow in the dark. And they were done you know, more for a novelty than anything else. I don't know that jellyfish that glow in the dark have any particular advantages or disadvantages over other jellyfish. Maybe if they were left in the wild, they would have disadvantages because it would be easy to, for uh, predator species to spot them. But um, Now, production of life-saving medicines, at least in my opinion, is a good use of genetic engineering. That's where, for example, we take the insulin, human insulin gene, and put it into uh, bacteria or fungi that can, can be grown in vats and then you harvest the insulin out of them. And that's what most people nowadays use for insulin if they need it. 
um, because unlike pork insulin or beef insulin, uh, it matches human insulin exactly. And so it has essentially no immune reactions to it, which used to be a, a problem in medicine. And for all those who are diabetic and require insulin, that's life-saving. It's very difficult for me to see how that would be a harmful use of, uh, of uh, and it would take a great deal of harm to balance the amount of good that it uh, produces. Um, there are, of course, production of supervirulent bacteria. There are people who are working on, I don't know whether they've actually gotten there, but since they're engineering it, it's technically genetic engineering, whether it fails or succeeds. And um, maybe I should put fails or succeeds in quotes because if they do succeed, uh, in my book, it would be a major failure. We don't need super resistant uh, smallpox bacteria uh, or viruses that, uh, uh, that uh, destroy the immune system while they're attacking the rest of the body. We just don't need that. And anybody who's working on that in my opinion, that's a bad use of uh, genetic engineering. And I don't think I'll get too much argument over that. Uh, there are things that probably don't really matter. And they're, I guess, a novelty, but other than that, they're neither good nor bad. Production of phosphorus and jellyfish is kind of an interesting thing to do, but I don't know that it um, makes it right or wrong in the grand scheme of things. And then, there's the production of genetically modified crops. And this is one that uh, gets a lot of people uh, on uh, arguing over whether it is good or bad, and uh, we'll go into that in some detail. Um, the major uh, crops that, are, that I'm going to pay attention to, because they're the major crops that are out there, are resistant crops to glyphosate, or Roundup, which is a uh, herbicide. And what that means is that you can grow the crop, you can spray it with Roundup, you don't have to worry about uh, whether the crop will all die, and you kill all the weeds. At least that's the theory. Um, there are crops that produce something called Bt toxin, Bt for Bacillus uh, thuringiensis, which is um, um, a um, distant cousin of anthrax, uh, and it produces a toxin that accumulates in insect guts and um, gets partially digested and then makes holes in the cell walls of the insect uh, uh, lining, uh, gut lining cells, and basically the insects die. And it is, in fact, a biological uh, crop control mechanism and has been used uh, as a spray for crops to kill the insects that are on it, with the idea, of course, that, that it eventually decays to uh, harmless uh, substances, uh, gets digested by whatever is out there, and uh, by the time the crop is harvested, um, all the toxin is gone, and uh, 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 in fact, because it's biological, that's considered organic as, a, as opposed to chemical. So if you get organic food, that's one of the things they can use to try to get rid of insect pests. And then, uh, but, but this particular one, what happens is you grow the crop with the Bt toxin being produced by the, uh, or by the uh, uh, crop itself, and so you don't have to spray. But of course, that means that it doesn't decay by the time you uh, uh, send it to market. So uh, people are getting exposed to Bt toxin. And then finally, there is the rice that was engineered to produce beta carotene, um, which is a kind of interesting way of uh, using uh, genetic engineering so that uh, uh, People who are in vitamin A deficient areas uh, can eat this rice, and um, they don't have vitamin A deficiency that way. Um, 
Now, the problem that I have when I uh, try to delve into this is that it's very difficult to find the truth. There are people who are willing to distort the, the evidence on both sides. Um, there are some who uh, have a major financial interest. Uh, millions, uh, in some cases billions of dollars are on the line. And um, that encourages cheating and there are always a few people who can't resist that. Uh, on the other hand, there are people who believe that nature is somehow sacred and that we must not defile a nature. Uh, this becomes almost, well, it becomes frankly a religious uh, belief uh, for which evidence does not matter. And um, if, if one has that goal, then there are people for whom uh, minor evils such as deceiving people for a short time in order to get uh, one's way are perfectly legitimate things to do. Uh, it's kind of a quasi postmodern philosophy, you know, that, uh, that if you have a big enough, uh, uh, an important enough uh, goal that any steps to reach that goal are justified. And of course, that kind of thing is on the movies all the time, you know, uh, where uh, the, the, the simple fact that your neighbor's car is available, uh, even though uh, your neighbor doesn't appreciate it, that doesn't matter as long as you really need to get out of uh, uh, the area when uh, the police are chasing you and you happen to have the code for uh, the nuclear uh, devices for the United States that uh, uh, need to get out of uh, the corrupt police's hands or whatever, you know. You can make up the uh, scenario on your own. Um, and you know, little things like, you know, breaking the law doesn't, don't really matter. Um, and what you need really for this whole thing is an honest broker. I'm gonna try to do that as much as I can. Uh, the problem uh, that we have is that, that Number one, nobody is willing to be one. And number two is if you ever come down on the side, you no longer are considered by the other side to be an honest broker. So it's pretty hard to, uh, it's pretty hard to find one and it's even harder to find one that most people can agree on because the problem is that people who really care, all they're interested is which side you come down on. So what I'm gonna try to do is review the pros and cons. And I've used two major sources, um, uh, one from each side. Uh, the first one is fairly detailed and has a lot of references, which is, in my opinion, very good. Um, and uh, um, it starts out by giving the advantages that some people list for uh, uh, genetic engineered crops. And um, I'll just go over them. They're an extension of natural breeding and they don't pose different risks from naturally bred crops, which most people are willing to allow to, to have happen. They are safe to eat and can be more nutritious than naturally bred crops. They are strictly re regulated for safety. They increase crop yields. They reduce pesticide use. They benefit farmers and make their lives easier. They bring economic benefits. They benefit the environment. They can help solve problems caused by climate change. They reduce energy use, and they will help to feed the world. Boy, I mean, <laughs> if that's the way it is, I, the case is pretty much closed, wouldn't you say? Um, and of course, this particular article goes on to dispute, dispute all of those. Um, they say they're laboratory made using technology that is totally different from natural breeding methods and pose different risks from non-genetically modified crops. They can be toxic, allergenic, or less nutritious than their ca natural counterparts. Um, presumably they, then they can not be as well. They're not adequately regulated to ensure safety. They do not increase yield potential. They do not reduce pesticide use, but increase it. 
Uh, they create serious problems for farmers, including herbicide tolerant superweeds, compromised soil quality, and increased disease susceptibility in crops. They have mixed economic effects. They harm soil quality, disrupt ecosystems, and reduce biodiversity. They do not effect, offer effective solutions to climate change. Um, they are as energy hungry as any other chemically farmed <coughs> crops. Um, that means that they take as much gasoline uh, to power the tractors and you know whatever else it takes. Um, they uh, cannot solve the problem of world hunger but distract from its real causes, poverty, lack of access to food, and increasingly lack of access to land to grow it on. So those are the those are the charges and the counter charges and um, this is at first the, probably the best case that one can make for um, uh, the non-use of uh, genetically modified crops. The fact that the genetically modified transformation processes is artificial does not automatically make it undesirable or dangerous. It is the consequences of the procedure that give cause for concern. Um, uh, there is a discussion of the pleiotropic effect of genes, which means that one gene will have multiple different effects, some of which weren't really expected. And one of the problems with genes is that they don't fade with time, as chemicals do. If you spray a crop early enough in the season, most of it, most of the time, will be gone by the time the crop is harvested, and so when people eat it, there's not as much concern. Whereas if the gene's there, it keeps going and going and going. Uh, there, he discussed the these people. There, there are two of them I actually uh, discuss radiation-induced mutations. There are apparently some 3,000 variety of radiation-induced mutations, which is basically you know, they plant crops near a radiation source, walk away and leave them, let them grow, uh, harvest the seeds, and then plant them and see what comes up. And of course, most of the time, it doesn't work very well. But there have been some commercially important traits that have come out of mutation breeding, such as the semi-dwarf uh, trait in rice. Notice this is a degeneration. Um, the hyolic acid trait in sunflowers, which is also a degeneration. In fact, all of these are degenerations, if you think about it. The semi-dwarf trait in barley and the low linolenic acid trait in canola are what I've seen usually is referred to as uh, rapeseed oil, and for some reason they call this oilseed reap all the time, which not the way I would want to use it. But um, <coughs> the reason mutation breeding is not more widely used is that the process of mutagenesis is risky, unpredictable, and does not efficiently generate beneficial mutations. Um, so for those of you who are wondering about how effective mutations are for advancing uh, uh, something. Uh, and remember, the semi-dwarf trait for barley is technically beneficial, but in fact it's knocking something out. So these are all degenerative changes, even the, quote, beneficial, end quote, ones. It's not beneficial for the plant itself necessarily. Uh, studies on fruit flies suggest that about 70% of mutations will have, and I would insert here, uh, obvious damaging effects on the function of the organism. And the remainder will be either neutral or weakly beneficial. And again, uh, depends on how you define beneficial. In plants as well as fruit flies, mutagenesis is a destructive process. As one textbook on plant breeding states, invariably the mutagen kills some cells outright while surviving plants display a right, wide range of deformities. Um, again, mutations are, the vast majority of them are, in fact, detrimental. Um, experts conclude that most such induced mutations are harmful and lead to unhealthy or, and or infertile plants. Occasionally, mutagenesis gives rise to a previously unknown feature that may be beneficial 
and can be exploited. Again, how we're defining beneficial is beneficial to us. Um, the insertion of the gen uh, genetically modified gene is an imprecise and uncontrolled process. Uh, there is the insertion itself, there are simultaneous insertions that happen, and there is the effective tissue culture. So there's several different things that can give you something different in the genetically modified uh, material from standard plant breeding, for example. Uh, and the way this is normally done, this is kind of interesting. Uh, those of you who were at the um, uh, Sanford uh, discussions um, may remember that he's the inventor of the gene gun. But what they basically do is they take gold or if they're going to be a little cheaper they take tungsten and they put uh, DNA around it and they basically fire it at uh, a tissue culture of a plant such as corn. Now the plant cell walls are really tough so it's not easy to poke a needle into them and just inject DNA. So what they, what they do is they, they use these basically kind of gold bullets, so to speak, to puncture through the cell walls. Um, and once they do, they bring the DNA with them. And then the DNA is incorporated into the uh, DNA of the corn. And then they grow the cells and they, they see which cells have, have gotten the um, DNA that they want. But now, how do you tell which cells actually got new DNA? Well, what they do is they put in antibiotic resistance into the, into the DNA as well as the desired trait, for example, uh, Bt toxin. And then they grow the cells uh, after they've had a chance to heal and, and uh, um, reproduce a little bit. They'll grow the cells in culture that has antibiotics in it. And the only cells that can survive are the antibiotics, uh, are the antibiotic resistant uh, cells, which presumably also have uh, the Bt toxin or whatever you've tried to put into it. And uh, of course, uh, that's an interesting way of, uh, of creating antibiotic resistance and uh, uh, has its own uh, questionable. Uh, 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 results. Every plant species has encountered natural mutagens, including, this is a fascinating sta statement in the, in the article. It's on page 16, that's what the number at the end means. Um, has encountered natural mutagens, including certain types and levels of ionizing radiation and chemicals throughout its natural history, and has evolved mechanisms for preventing, repairing, and minimizing the impacts of mutations caused by such agents. But plants have not evolved mechanisms to repair or compensate for the insertional mutations that occur during genetic modification. So um, I guess, uh, you know, it's uh, an open question, but obviously these people are operating from an evolutionary perspective. Um, Mutation breeding is not regulated. Uh, general, uh, uh, genetic modification is safer than mutation breeding and therefore should not be regulated. That's, a, uh, that's an argument that has been used. Um, and then they cite studies by Batista and colleagues and Walia uh, and colleagues uh, that are used by the genetic uh, modification industry in order to argue that. And their comment is, interestingly, the GM proponents' conclusions were diametrically opposite to the conclusion that Batista and colleagues drew from their findings. The researchers concluded that crop varieties produced through mutation breeding and crops produced through genetic engineering should both be subjected to rigorous safety, safety testing. In other words, um, it's a little bit like the argument that I used to always kind of ignore when I was a kid that uh, uh, marijuana was no more dangerous than alcohol and alcohol was legal and so marijuana should be legal and I always thought, well, uh, maybe you can make that argument for legal but you certainly can't make that argument for my using it. Um, 
because I don't drink either. <laughs> um, then uh, they, they make another comment that is even more interesting. When you fertilize the ovum, overgoes, undergoes sister chromatid exchange as part of conventional breeding. The chromosome rearrangements do not take place in a random and haphazard way, but are precisely guided so that no information is lost. And that's generally true. There can be defects in the process, which could lead to mutations, but the process works against defects occurring by employing precise cellular mechanisms that have evolved over hundreds of thousands of years to preserve the order and information content of the genome of the species. Um, I don't know whose brand of evolution they believe in. It's certainly, <laughs> it's certainly a little longer than, or, than, uh, than uh, a creationist evolutionary hypothesis, but um, it does seem to be a little short for the standard uh, model. Um, <clears throat> And then they give three quotes which, is, which are fascinating. Monsanto should not have to vouchsafe the safety of biotech food. Our interest is in selling as much of it as possible. Assuring its safety is the FDA's job. And that's a quote from Philip Angel. And then, uh, of course, the Food and Drugs Administration sees things somewhat differently. Ultimately, it is the food producer who is responsible for assuring safety. Um, okay. And then uh, the European people chime in. It is not foreseen that EFSA carry out such safety studies as the onus is on the GM industry applicant to demonstrate the safety of the GM product in question. Now, there are two different ways you could look at this. Number one is no one's minding the store, and that's a possibility. The other one is uh, Philip Angel wants to say that once we pass FDA, nobody should be able to sue us. Which means, of course, if the FDA does bad work, then they can sue the FDA. And the FDA is maybe making a statement that says, no, uh, no, you got it all wrong. It's Monsanto's problem all the way. We'll do what we can, but we're, we're not guaranteeing anything. Uh, or perhaps even more, uh, it's their job to do the studies. So. Uh, unfortunately, the context uh, in the article that I was reading was not clear. Um, that's one of the things that you have to do when you read these things is you have to ask questions behind how people are using them because sometimes the, the meaning can be different depending on the context. The article goes on to say claims of substantial equivalence for GM foods are widely criticized as unscientific by independent researchers. Um, the, this is the argument that says basically substantial equivalent is genetically modified corn. It's basically got the same things in it that uh, regular corn does. So, you know, as long as there's no major difference, why it doesn't really matter which corn you use. And uh, their comment is a useful analogy is that of a BSE infected cow and a healthy cow. They are substantially equivalent to one another in that their chemical composition is the same. The only difference is in the shape of a minor component of a protein, prion, a difference that would not be picked up by a substantial equivalence assessment. Yet, few would claim that eating a BSA-infected cow is as safe as eating a healthy cow. Leaving aside, of course, the question about healthy cows in general, but uh, I, I think one could easily argue that BSE-infected cows are not as safe. Um, and then they quote, um, th this is um, uh, an article that got into science, so it's, you know, presumably uh, reasonable questioning. I suggest to biotechnology companies that they publish results of studies on the safety of GM foods in international peer-reviewed journals. The general population in the scientific community cannot be expected to take it on faith that the results of such studies are favorable. Informed decisions are made on the basis of experimental data, not faith. And I think that that's a reasonable criticism. I think that one of the things that should happen is that, and nowadays it can be done. You can put stuff on the internet and anybody who wants to can read through it, including the original logs if you want. Um, that any study that is being used to justify human consumption of something 
should be uh, open and um, should be adequate to pass peer review. Um, unpublished studies, this is the comment that they're making, fall into the category of so-called gray literature, unpublished documents of unknown reliability. Such gray literature stands in stark contrast to the gold standard of science peer-reviewed publication. The peer-reviewed publication process, while far from perfect, and uh, <laughs> when it's politicized becomes even uh, less perfect, is the best method that scientists have come up with to ensure reliability. Its strength lies in a multi-step quality control process. And then they give that process. The uh, lack of availability in, in, of industry studies in the past has resulted in the public being deceived over the safety of GMOs. For example, industry's raw data on Monsanto's GM BT maize varieties, that's bacterial toxin that we were talking about earlier, um, and maize is, of course, corn, um, approved in the EU in 2005, were only forced into the open through court action by Greenpeace. Then independent scientists at the French-based research organization Cryogen analyzed the raw data and found that Monsanto's own feeding trial on rats revealed serious health effects, including liver and kidney toxicity, that had been hidden from the public. And then there's a comment that they quote, unfortunately it is impossible to verify that genetically modified crops perform as advertised. This is because agritech companies have given themselves veto power over the work of independent researchers. Research on genetically modified seeds is still published, of course, but only studies that the seed companies have approved ever see the light of a peer-reviewed journal. And uh, this is one of the drawbacks of peer review, of course. Um, in a number of cases, experiments that, experiments that had the implications, implicit go-ahead from the seed company were later blocked from publication because the results were not flattering. It would be chilling enough if any other type of company were able to prevent independent researchers from testing its wares and reporting what they find. But when scientists are prevented from examining the raw ingredients in our nation's food supplier from testing the plant material, that covers a large portion of the country's agricultural lands, the restrictions on free inquiry become dangerous. And by the way, that's from Scientific American, um, which says that um, one of the claims that has been used is uh, the whole scientific community says there's nothing wrong with this. Well, that's not quite true. Um, in 2007, and this is the, I think we have two cases to go through that are of interest. Uh, Professor uh, Jills Eric Saralini, researcher in molecular biology at the University of Caen, I'm probably butchering that, pardon my French, and president of the Independent Research Institute, Cryogen, and his research team published a reanalysis of a Monsanto 90-day rat feeding study that the company had submitted in support of application for approval of GM maize Mon863, which we've seen before. Approval was granted for uh, food and feed in the EU in um, 2005. Monsanto tried to keep the feeding trial data secret, claiming commercial confidentiality, but it was forced into the open by a court ruling in Germany. Serlini's reanalysis of the Monsanto data showed that the rats fed GM maize had reduced growth in signs of liver and kidney toxicity. Serlini concluded that it could not be assumed that the maize was safe and asked for such studies to be performed for regulatory purposes to be extended beyond the 90 days so that the consequences of the initial signs of toxicity could be investigated. After Serlini and his team published this and other papers showing harmful effects from the GM crops, and the glyphosate herbicide used uh, with GM Roundup Ready crops. Uh, Roundup Ready, of course, is the brand name, and that means that you can use it with Roundup, which is what glyphosate is. Um, or more precisely, glyphos uh, Roundup is glyphosate. It's the brand name. He was subjected to a vicious smear campaign. The smears appeared to come from the French uh, Association of Plant Biotechnologies, 
uh, chaired by Mark Falouse. Seralini believed that the researchers Claude Allegre Exocon and Marc Felice were behind the defamation and intimidation campaigns in, in France. He sued Felice for libel, arguing that the campaign had damaged his reputation, reducing his opportunities for work, and his chances of getting funding for his research. During the trial, it was revealed that Felice, who presented himself as a neutral scientist without personal interests and who accused those who criticized GMOs as ideological and militant, own patents through a company based in Israel. This company sells patents to GM corporations such as Aventis. Saralini's lawyer showed that other AFBVM members also had links with agribusiness co companies. The court found in Saralini's favor. The judges sentenced the AFB to a fine on probation of uh, 1,000 euros, one euro for compensation, which is minimal, of course, and 4,000 euros in court fees, which is really kind of a minor, fee, uh, minor fine. Um, although the people in this paper don't make that point. Um, on, and here's another example that the paper gives. On the 10th August of 1998, the GM debate changed forever with the broadcast of a current affairs documentary on British television about genetically modified food safety. The program featured a brief but revealing interview with the internationally renowned scientist, Dr. Arpad uh, Pustai, about his research into GM food safety. Pustai talked of his findings that GM potatoes had harmed the health, health of rat laboratory rats. Rats fed GM potatoes showed excessive growth of the lining of the gut similar to a precancerous condition and toxic reactions in multiple organ systems. These are uh, BT producing potatoes, by the way. Uh, Pustai had gone public with his findings prior to publication for reasons of the public interest, particularly as the research had been funded by the British taxpayer. He gave his television interview with the full backing of his employers, the Road Institute in Scotland. After the broadcast aired, a political storm broke. Within days, Bustai had been gagged and fired by the Road. His research team was disbanded and his data was confiscated. His telephone calls and email were diverted. He was subjected to a campaign of vilification and misrepresentation by pro-GM scientific bodies and individuals in an attempt to discredit him and his research. What caused the Roet's turnaround? It was later reported that there had been a phone call from Monsanto to the then U.S. President Bill Clinton and from Clinton to then uh, U.K. Pr Prime Minister Tony Blair and from Blair to the, Ro to the Roet Institute. And I forgot to put a, uh, a, a paragraph there. Untruths and represent misrepresentations about Pustai's research continue to be circulated by GM proponents. These include claims that no GM potatoes were fed at all and that the experiment lacked proper controls. Both claims are easily shown to be false by reading of the study, which subsequently passed peer review by a larger than usual team of reviewers and was published in The Lancet. So he finally got it into the, the uh, medical literature anyway, or the scientific literature. Uh, criticisms of the study design are particularly unsound because it was reviewed by the Scottish office and won a GPB 1.6 million grant over 28 uh, other competing designs. According to Pustai, it was also reviewed by the BBSRC, the UK's main public science funding body. Even Pustai's critics have not suggested that he did not follow the study design as it was approved, and if his study had lacked proper controls, the BBSRC and the Scottish office would have faced serious questions. Interestingly, one of the critics who claimed that Pustai's experiments lacked proper controls had previously co-authored and published with Pustai, uh, Pustai a study on genetically modified peas with exactly the same design. In fact, the only notable difference between this study and Pustai's uh, genetically modified potato study was the result. The peas study had concluded that the genetically modified peas were as safe as non-GM peas, whereas the potato study had found that the GM potatoes were unsafe. Uh, Pustai's uh, genetically modified potato research continues to be cited in the peer-reviewed literature as a valid study. So 
there appears to be some, um, shall we say, intimidation going on. Uh, the best known attempt to nutritionally improve a genetically modified crop is beta-carotene enriched golden rice. The crop is intended for use in poor countries in the global south where vitamin A deficiency causes blindness, illness, and deaths. However, despite over decades worth of headlines hyping golden rice as a miracle crop, it is still not available in the marketplace. Um, genetically modified uh, crop proponents blame excessive regulation and anti-GM activists for delaying the com commercialization of golden rice. But according to this paper anyway, the real reasons for the delay seem to be basic research and development problems. The first golden rice variety had insufficient beta carotene content and would have needed to be consumed in kilogram quantities per day. Although to be fair, these people eat rice and that's what they eat. Uh, to provide the required dietary vitamin A intake. As a result, a totally new genetically modified rice variety had to be generated with much higher beta carotene content. Also, the process of back crossing golden rice with varieties that performed well in farmers' fields in order to ensure a viable pro product has taken many years. A 2008 article in the journal Science said that there was still a long way to go in the back crossing process. Uh, so it's not as easy to do gen make genetically modified crops work as it might sound. It has taken over a decade to develop golden rice, yet as of 2012, field trials have not been completed to ensure that it grows successfully in local conditions, nor has it been tested in toxicological feeding trials on animals to establish whether it is safe to eat. In contrast with the problematical bulk golden rice, inexpensive and effective methods of combating vitamin A deficiency have long been available. The most commonly used method is vitamin A supplements. A uh, review published in the British Medical Journal assessed 43 studies involving uh, 100,000 children and found deaths were cut by 24% if children were given the vitamin. The researchers estimated that giving vitamin A supplements to children under the age of five in developing countries could save 600,000 lives a year. They concluded vitamin A supplements are highly effective and cheap to produce and administer. Of course, uh, what this article leaves out is that culturally there are a lot of parents who don't want to give their kids vitamins in those countries. Um, that's one of the reasons, one of the uh, reasons that the uh, golden rice was so attractive is because you could simply put it in as, instead of rice and people would eat it. Um, Polan is one of the several critics who suggested that the real value of golden rice lies in its usefulness as a public relations strategy to boost the tarnished image of the biotechnology industry. Paul and Wright the, wrote that golden rice seemed less like a solution to vitamin A deficiency than to the public relations problem of an industry that has so far offered consumers precious few reasons to buy what it's selling and more than a few to avoid it. Now, this is the point at which the, the article starts to, in, at least in my opinion, jump the shark. I, I think that's... Um, the, that seems to me to be a little paranoid. Um, they talk about the um, uh, genetically modified purple tomato that was supposed to have more vitamin C, more this, more that, uh, anthocyanins and, and such, and uh, the difficulties that they had uh, producing it. And then they have finished it up with this discussion um, in 2011, the GIC's uh, genetically modified purple tomato became entirely <coughs> redundant when Brazilian <coughs> researchers announced that they had developed a non-genetically modified, that means pr plant breeding, so it's obviously genetically modified, but just not by those techniques, um, purple tomato with high levels of anthocyanins and vitamin C. In contrast with the GIC's genetically modified tomato, the non-GM tomatoes received little publicity. Um, one of the problems that, um, that you have with um, genetically modifying crops is that they can do strange things. Uh, canola, uh, 
is grown particularly in Canada. Uh, and they made this genetically modified canola that can't be killed with Roundup. And the idea, of course, was that you make canola fields and you spray them with Roundup and then you kill everything else and, the, and the, uh, you get better yields of canola because there's no weeds. But genetically modified canola itself has become a weed. Feral canola populations have acquired resistance to all of the main herbicides used in Canada making it difficult and expensive to control volunteer canola and soy and maize fields. Feral herbicide resistant canola has also become a problem in sugar beet fields in the US where canola seeds are reported to be deposited by defecation from geese migrating from Canada. Now of course they're still not resistant to being pulled up by hand so that's basically what you have to do is you have to go back into the fields and actually remove the weeds. Um, uh, U.S. farmers have uh, grown increasingly concerned about the high price and poor performance of genetically modified seed. A 2011 media report said that the seed companies had responded by withdrawing a high-performing non-GM variety of maize, which gave higher yields than GM varieties. So you're going to have to take GM. Um, that's kind of weird to say it, to put it bluntly. These companies are generally speaking interested in making money and if you can make more money on non-GM seed than you can make on GM seed, it would seem that they would simply sell more of the, the non-GM seed. Um, I, I, the motive behind this particular accused uh, activity is not clear. The report added that the companies are hiking the prices of herbicides used by non-GM farmers to artificially increase the cost of non-GM production. Uh, so that you have to buy the GM variety, otherwise uh, your herbicide becomes too expensive. Um, yes. Uh, it, it may appear a little bit puzzling why the GM companies would engage in this kind of brinkmanship. But the issues are very simple. The non-GM um, crops are not controlled by them. The GM crops, they have a patent on and sole distribution for. Thus, they essentially are the only ones that can distribute them l legitimately. So if the non-GM crops are favored in whatever way, then basically they lose territory because any other company can come in and offer those. That is, that is true. Uh, the, other, the other problem is though that some other seed company can now produce the non-GM uh, uh, seeds and, and uh, basically corner the market on them and leave the GM people out on the cold. So although it's, although in a short-sighted way they might be pushing this because they think they've got a patent on the seeds and once everybody has to go to GM, uh, you're stuck with them. Uh, in fact, uh, if, that's, if that's their, uh, motive, then it's a very short-sighted one. There are other seed companies besides Monsanto and uh, so forth. Farmers have little choice but to tolerate such price hikes because of this consolidation within the seed industry. Um, in other words, the GM industry dictates which seed varieties are available. Um, in 2008, 85% of GM maize patents and 70% of non-maize uh, GM plant patents. So you can get non-GM plant patents as well. In the U.S., we're owned by the top three seed companies, Monsanto, DuPont, and uh, Syngenta. Even these three companies are not independent of each other, but increasingly the ne network to cross-license GM seed traits. So, uh, uh, Syngenta develops a seed uh, 
that's resistant to a Monsanto pesticide where they might uh, uh, get into an agreement with each other. And uh, I think that's a problem when you have uh, too few big companies because then you don't have the competition that you want. Uh, the largest of the big three companies, of course, is Monsanto, uh, which you may recognize as the major funder for the opposition to Proposition 37. In 2010, Monsanto raised its prices for its RR2 soybeans and SmartStacks maize seeds so steeply that the U.S. Department of Justice launched an investigation into the consolidation of agribusiness firms that has led to anti-competitive pricing and monopolistic practices. Farmers actively gave evidence against companies like Monsanto. Now the one thing that's unfortunate is they don't say what actually happened when that ha happened. The same pattern has been reported in India. Moreover, as prices of GM, BT, cotton seed have escalated, 134 non-GM varieties, in some cases better performing than the GM varieties, have been withdrawn from the market. The result is that farmers are forced in, into dependency on the GM industry. Such reports expose claims that GM crops increase farmer choice as misleading. In countries where legal liability for GM contamination is clearly established, GM crop cultivation has become severely restricted. In Germany, a law which has, has been passed making farmers who grow GM crops liable for economic damages to non-GM and organic farmers resulting from GM contamination. You have wheat in your field, the other guy is wheat in his field, uh, you get cross-pollination and their stuff is now genetically modified, you pay for it. Uh, that has a, shall we say, chilling effect. Uh, the law has virtually halted the planting of GM crops in the country because farmers are not prepared to accept liability for contam contamination. Um, the fact that farmers who previously chose to grow GM crops have ceased to do so because of the fact that they could be held liable for damages is clear evidence that coexistence is impossible. And so now the people who are <coughs> writing the paper are making the case that you have to have it one way or the other way and, and, and uh, of course they've already argue very strongly that the other way is not good and so therefore we should simply get rid of genetic modification period. In light of this, it is not surprising that the GMC industry has lobbied forcefully against the implementa implementation of similar liability laws in the U.S. and Canada. Um, traditionally, most food seed crops have not been owned by anyone. Farmers have been free to save seed from one year's crop for the next year's crop. And um, that's generally true as it, as it notes. But this ancient practice is being undermined. The transgenes used in creating genetically modified crops are patented and owned by GM companies. The patents forbid farmers from saving seeds to plant in the following year. They have to buy new seed each year. Now that, in my opinion, is a major problem. While an increasing number of non-GM seeds are also being patented, in many cases by the big GM companies. Uh, GM seeds are easier to patent as the artificial genetic constructs can be more clearly identified and there are fewer legal gray areas. So for the time being, at least, genetic modification will remain the technology of a choice for the seed multinationals. In the United States and Canada, the, the, presidents of a, uh, the presence of a company's patented GM genes in a farmer's harvest has been used by GM companies, particularly Monsanto, as the basis for litigation against the farmer. You're using our seed without our permission. Contamination from cross-pollination happens readily, so the harvests of many farmers who have not planted Monsanto seed have tested positive for GM genes and Monsanto has sued them for patent infringement. This has pushed many farmers into switching to buying Monsanto seeds because then they're safer from litigation. Farmers' claims that they have not intentionally planted GM crops have not protected them from having to pay large cash settlements or damages as a result of civil lawsuits. And that, in my opinion, is an abuse of process. This is the now, this is the claim that the people who made the, uh, do this make. Patents have no place in the agricultural system. To protect the security of the food supply and to ensure food sovereignty for each nation, governments must establish practices 
that ensure the control of food production remains in the hands of farmers. Um, I'm sympathetic. Uh, perhaps what should happen is the patents should be much more limited than what they are. It is not necessary to accept the risks posed by GM crops with, when conventional breeding, sometimes assisted by safe biotechnology such as marker-assisted selection, uh, which is still kind of sort of conventional breeding, continues to successfully produce crops that are high-yielding, drought-tolerant, climate-ready, pest and disease-resistant, and nutritious. Conventional breeding, the existing crop varieties developed by farmers worldwide and agroecological farming methods are proving effective me methods of meeting our current and future food needs. In other words, they're arguing you don't need this. Now, I, I think they exaggerate a little bit, but I think that uh, they are presenting a problem and one of the problems in my opinion is that is the economic one. I think that the that uh, it's unconscionable for Monsanto to sue a farmer because he happens to live next door to another farmer that uses his product and then claim that the the farmer shouldn't have uh, should be uh, not uh, planting a genetically modified seed when in fact that's not what they did. Um, the, the truth of the matter is, for, for most of us, there is not much that we can do. Uh, I mean, you can write your congressman most of the time. They won't listen to it. Um, I think one of the things we can do is we can decide whether or not we eat it. Um, and the, the lazy man's way to do that is to eat organic foods. Um, organic, by definition, does not include genetic modification, and so you can't legally sell genetically modified foods as organic. Um, there is an attempt to get labeling laws, and the one that's uh, probably most prominent right now is California's Proposition 37 which basically requires all genetically modified foods uh, to be labeled, well, most of them anyway. And the question is, is Proposition 37 a good idea? Well, you know, uh, instinctively, I think the answer is yes. The uh, question is, what are they trying, uh, you know, are there complications to that particular law? And um, for this part, I'm indebted to the no on uh, 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 37 uh, website. They claim that there will be higher grocery bills uh, and that really hinges on uh, a couple of other things. Uh, the labeling is going to be relatively minor because labeling is designed to phase in so that people can use all the labels they've already printed up and it's simply a matter of adding one more little thing to that list of ingredients that you've seen. This contains genetically modified material. And you don't even have to label whether it's the corn or the potatoes or what part of it is genetically modified. You just say it's genetically modified and you're done with it. They claim that it conflicts with science. Well, that depends on how you define science. Um, and certainly uh, with the BT toxin, it's a major question of if you get enough of it, does it have, uh, does it give problems to mammals like people, you know. Um, and it's difficult to sort through all of the science, you know, which stuff, maybe the Roundup Ready stuff is fine, but the BT toxin stuff is not. Um, the labeling at least gives people a choice. Um, I'm not sure that that's a uh, major count against it. There are special interest exemptions. Well, Almost everything has special interest exemptions. And the special interests that they are particularly concerned about, and if they have better evidence than that, they really should have used it instead, is that soy milk requires labeling, but cow's milk doesn't. Well, unless you're using genetically modified cows, it's not a problem. And soy milk is a problem, or at least is a perceived problem. 
So I'm not sure how much water that particular argument will hold. Um, you know. Um, and then the one that probably bothers me the most is uh, shakedown lawsuits. And the idea there is that you don't have to prove damages according to the law if you want to sue somebody. Uh, the damages are already set at the price of the food, um, which means that the, the damages are the entire crop. Um, and how many people will get sued and then settle because they don't dare keep going because they don't have enough funds to support the legal apparatus? Uh, and that is a concern. The other thing that's fascinating is that, according to their claim that all the newspapers agree, or at least the vast majority of them, including such outfits as the Los Angeles Times, which you usually think of as being kind of ecologically friendly. Um, maybe they're not as friendly as we thought. Or maybe the case is not as good as we thought. And uh, that does give me pause. The Los Angeles Times, uh, you wouldn't expect them to be, uh, uh, be anti-environmental, and this is kind of into the environmental uh, area. Um, the shakedown lawsuits, the, 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 big deal, the big deal about it is that you don't have to prove that I got cancer because of it. All you have to prove is that you should have labeled it and you didn't, and here's how much money you made. And that's the damages. Well, actually, not even how much money you made, but how much money you got for your crop. So the, the expenses of, of, uh, of, doing the, of, of producing the crop are not taken out. Now, the question, and I haven't seen a definitive answer on this, and it would be one that, um, that I think should be answered before I could say for sure whether this is a good or a bad law, is can you be sued because you were growing grain next to a genetically modified field and you got more than 1%, which seems to be the, the, lo the limit, of genetically modified food in your own crop And, you know, this starts to raise the question, are, are we dealing with science where you, the question is, does it really actually hurt you? Or are we dealing with a religion that says you don't mess with Mother Nature? And uh, it, it almost sounds like it's starting to be a religion. Um, there, uh, there is a comment from the back that it, it specifically excludes this kind of problem. I, I think that as long as innocent people don't get caught, well, then you just label it and you know that you label it under more severe penalties than usual. Um, now, I think that regardless of which way the, the, the vote goes on this, and it could go either way from what I understand, there's... Uh, um, it started out as highly positive, and then uh, the advertising campaign has driven it down. Uh, again, the advertising campaign is mainly funded by Monsanto for what I think are obvious reasons. Um, is that I think it's, and, and of course there'll be people who live in Nevada or Utah or New Jersey or someplace that that uh, that don't have uh, California's. Uh, supposed protection and hopefully protection. Um, but uh, you can still avoid the major part of this by uh, buying organic. Now, to bring this into uh, another area which is of interest to most of us here, there's a general parallel, the Im implications for the creation evolution controversy. Um, you know, where you have science versus science, and whose science is it? Um, only this time, the, the lines are not as clearly drawn, and it's almost, 
it's almost a um, industrial science versus religion in this case, whereas in the other case it's more of a uh, religious science versus uh, religion in some ways. Um, there are powerful interests on both sides, and in in the creation evolution controversy, we know that some of those powerful interests on both sides will resort to uh, what basically amounts to lying or fraud. In one case, uh, the Piltdown Man, that most of us are familiar with, and in the other case, a uh, Poxy Footprints. Uh, I'm not saying that everybody who advocates or advocated either one of these was lying, but somebody at the root of both of those uh, was lying. Um, and the other thing that's interesting is this is an example of intentional lateral gene transfer. Lateral gene transfer has gotten a lot of uh, noise lately in biology because it seems to be required for um, all of the similarities between various uh, organisms that evolutionary, uh, evolutionarily are widely separate. Um, but intentional lateral gene transfer is, in fact, intelligent design. And so if we see lateral gene transfer, maybe we should start asking ourselves, maybe this isn't just accidental, maybe it is evidence for in fact, intelligence. And finally, uh, the, one of the interesting things is that, you know, when they're doing these uh, uh, injection experiments, the um, genetically modified material gets incorporated into semi-random areas of the genome. And of course, the assumption is made that it doesn't really matter where they get incorporated because as long as they get incorporated, most of the genome is junk anyway, so it doesn't really, you know, if you have it in an uh, unusual place, why uh, the, the plant will get by just fine. Uh, don't worry about that. And the interesting thing is that we now know that uh, there's considerably less junk DNA than was thought at first, and, uh, and we may in fact be introducing uh, changes that are more profound than we realized. Um, yes, we have a comment here, uh, but can you hold that for just one minute here, and then I'll, uh, uh, and then I think I will get to you because I think that's my, actually my last comment, and uh, I'm going to now open the, uh, open the uh, field for people to respond to what I've had to say. Well, one thing I noticed you, you hadn't brought out is that a lot of these these genetic pellets that they inject at 300 miles an hour into the cell, that's not chromosomes. That's DNA that's what we call plasmids. It's a little circular DNA. Yes. And it's not, and it doesn't restrict itself to the species barrier. It can cross the species barrier spontaneously. And the idea is that you could get some of this stuff going into bacteria or something else that happened to feed on the corn as it was degenerating. Or you eat the genetic modified material and the plasmids inject itself into your own cells. Mm, well, get injected, but yes. Um, that's, of course, what we, uh, to be fair, when we're, when we're discussing that, you have to also notice that there are other plasmids that uh, are in bacteria that have uh, bacterial resistance genes, for example, on them. And uh, uh, most of us have not gotten uh, uh, bacterial resistance from those plasmids, even though they've been around for uh, uh, a long time. So. Uh, although it's a theoretical concern, uh, as a practical concern, it's probably minor. Uh, frankly, uh, of genetic modification myself, if I were to put the, the things that I'm most concerned about, one of them is uh, Bt toxin in large doses might be giving us trouble. And um, uh, and perhaps in smaller doses we tolerate it well. Well, I mean, after all, it comes from bac uh, Bacillus. Uh, Thuringiensis, and um, 
nuts, you know, running around in the soil and whatnot. And uh, so anybody who's eaten dirt has gotten a little bit of it, and it's not. But dosage matters. And large doses may be more harmful to us than small doses, just like doses of tobacco smoke matter. Uh, large doses are much worse for you than small doses. One or two, between one and two. Um, so uh, that's, that's one concern. The other concern that I have, frankly, the, the one that I'm concerned is much or more than anything else, is the, is the economic stranglehold that, uh, that, uh, that large seed companies appear to be trying to, uh, you know, they look like they're trying to corner the market, if I can put it that way. Establish and, a monopoly. Uh, and, and that bothers me probably as much as or more than what we're eating. Uh, I am not religious in that sense about eating food. Uh, if I can put it this way, if Jesus was willing to eat fish, why I'm willing to eat some genetically modified material. But, um, you know, uh, I am concerned when we start... Uh, you know, taking farmers out of the equation and squashing them down, uh, and uh, at the same time bringing up the price of food. You know, if it was a matter of uh, everybody else does better, that's one thing. But it looks like Monsanto is the main uh, uh, beneficiary for all this, and I'm not sure that Monsanto is a is that much of a charitable organization. Um, any other comments or on soybeans, genetically modified soybeans, uh, I'm not. Uh, nearly as concerned about the genetic modification as that I am about all my soybeans being sprayed with Roundup. And that's a problem. And that's not one that I didn't dr address directly, although the paper did, because it wasn't a nice, punchy thing that I could give. As you can see, I've already run over time, and uh, <laughs> I was trying to cut this down as much as I could. Uh, but th uh, that's a problem with soybeans. Uh, 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 you, you, you engineer this stuff and then you spray Roundup. You spray Roundup in massive amounts because you don't worry about the soybeans getting killed. Um, but you don't worry about the runoff either and, you know, and what it does for the environment in general. And, and uh, the theory is that glyphosate eventually de decays and you don't have to worry about it. Um, Currently in Germany, Monsanto was forced not to say that uh, by a lawsuit. Uh, so, although it may be partially true, it's probably it's probably not as true as Monsanto would like you to believe. And so, what happens is you do genetically modified crops, and the amount of herbicide goes up. If that's not a positive, then that's um, then it's not a positive. Uh, I kind of prefer, in general, for us to use less rather than more chemicals in our in our diet. Well, I guess if um, all of the questions have been given in the statements, why, uh, we'll close then. And um, next week we'll be talking about um, the Bill Nye, the science guy, and his comments on, uh, uh, on uh, creationist uh, parents should not be allowed to teach their children creationism. <laughs>